Well, welcome back to part three of 126 years of high frequency amateur radio innovation. Uh, this time we're going to discuss uh, what has happened from 1945 to the present. Hi, I'm Jim Hanlon, W8KGI, out here in Sandia Park, New Mexico, and I'm privileged to be able to uh, give a little talk to the AWA this year on 126 years of amateur radio HF innovation. I'll step aside and let you see how crazy I am. In the time between 1945 and the end of the 50s, uh, there were quite a few transitions in amateur radio. Uh, we changed from amplitude modulated phone to a single sideband phone. And when it came to equipment, we changed mostly from homebrew transmitters in 1945 to, uh, to kits and then to commercial built equipment. The kits, like the Heathkit AT1 and the uh, DX100, for example, were actually uh, better radios uh, and less expensive than what you could put together yourself in those days. Uh, transceivers also came in in the, uh, the end of the 50s. First of all, with the Collins KWM-1, which covered 20, 15, and 10 meters. And they pretty much uh, upended the market for separate transmitters and receivers. Receivers were largely the same as they were before the war, with the exception of the Collins 75A, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But it was a, uh, a new handband only design. Collins also brought out their mechanical filter in 1953, which gave much better selectivity to receivers. Uh, significant events, probably the most significant event I think of this era, was the uh, novice and technician licenses, which came along in 1951 and brought a lot of uh, new hams into the, uh, the game, uh, myself included. After 1945, when the war ended, the ham bands were restored really pretty quickly. Um, the war ended on August 14th, 1945. <coughs> And at the end of uh, the next week, the hams were actually allowed back on the old two and a half meter band. Uh, in November, that was changed to our current two meter band. Also in November, we got back 10 meters. Uh, our new six meter band, which uh, was given to us in place of five meters, which was reallocated uh, for television reasons. And we also got five UHF bands in the middle of November. And by uh, March of uh, 1946, we got an allocation at 11 meters, believe it or not, and some more uh, uh, UHF bands. By uh, May, we got back 80 meters, and then by July, we got 40 and 20 meters back. So we were off and running by uh, the middle of 1946. Then in 1952, we got uh, 15 meters, losing 50 kc of uh, of 20 to pay for it and uh, we began to get limited segments of 160 meters back as well from the Loran service receivers right after the war were largely just updated uh, pre-war receivers uh, with the exception of the Collins 75a1 which was a uh, handband only design that used crystal control converters ahead of a tunable IF and offered uh, great calibration. You could read your uh, uh, your frequency to, uh, to 1 kilohertz with the 75A1, which was certainly something new for receivers at that point in time. Uh, transmitters were still AMCW updates of uh, pre-war designs. But kits, uh, significant kits, were offered by uh, Leo Meyerson at World Radio Labs, by uh, Johnson, and by Eldico. World War II surplus hit the market in 1947, 
and there were some things that were snapped up uh, quite quickly, uh, including BC-610 transmitters, which were the pre-war helicopters HT-4, as you know, and uh, Collins ART-13 transmitters, which were auto-tune transmitters that uh, were developed during the war. There were a bunch of uh, receivers as well. Uh, the Signal Corps had developed uh, BC-312s, 342s, and 348s, and uh, the BC-779 and 1004 were super pros. Uh, there were also HRO and NC-100 type receivers that went quickly. Uh, there was crystal controlled 2 meter gear, uh, the SCR-522 and ARC-5. Uh, sets that uh, got a lot of hams on the 2 meter AM and then there were the command sets. Uh, they were basically uh, transmitters and receivers for the range from uh, 3 to 9 megahertz. Uh, there were some low frequency receivers as well. There was one that covered four, um, 455 KC and was used as a q fiber to improve the selectivity of uh, super hats that had 455 KC IFs. But command sets were wonderful. There were almost a million and a half transmitters and receivers made during the war. A lot of them came onto the surplus market and they were used for everything. Here's a picture of the uh, Collins uh, 75A1 receiver on the right and the 32V1 transmitter on the left. Collins really uh, got into the uh, the amateur equipment market right after the war with these two. Uh, they were not cheap. 75A1 at uh, $375 was uh, uh, all ham bands 80 through 10 and the 32V1 at $475 uh, I think the V3 finally got up to 590 bucks. It was a 150 watt fully band switching transmitter with a pie match. And it had that wonderful Collins permeability tuned oscillator that gave you uh, 1 kilohertz calibration on 80 and 5 kilohertz on 10. Here's some of the World Radio Labs uh, kit offerings that uh, Leo Meyerson came out with. The Globe Schrotter up there on the top was a uh, 160 through 10 uh, AMCW 25 watt phone, 40 watt uh, uh, CW, crystal controlled transmitter. You could set it up for three bands or plug in coils for more bands. And it was one of the first post-war inexpensive kit transmitters. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum was the Globe King 275. Uh, came out in 1947, $351, uh, with plug-in coils all around, 80 through 10 meters, AM and CW, uh, 275 watts input, about 200 watts output on mine. Uh, it's crystal controlled, and it's the first of a family of Globe Kings that went through the uh, Globe King 500C in 1959, and uh, it was a 500 watt transmitter. That thing is big and heavy. I can remember when I brought it home the old Pontiac was uh, <laughs> uh, sagging in the back because it was in the trunk, but uh, that was quite a transmitter. Johnson also came out uh, beginning in 1949 with a number of kits. They had previously made uh, coils and capacitors and things of that sort they put them together in the Viking 1 in 1949, which was sort of a reverse engineered 32V1. Uh, <coughs> covers 160 through 10, and uh, a good bit of range outside of that as well. Uh, it's crystal controlled. You can buy the Johnson VFO kit for another 4275. And um, in 1952, Viking came out or Johnson came out with the Viking 2, which is basically the Viking 1 uh, that's DTVI. One other difference between the two is the Viking 2 used a pair of 6146s in the final. The Viking 1 used a 4D32, a single tube, same tube that the uh, 32V line of transmitters used, 
but that tube became particularly hard to get a hold of uh, during the Korean War. So a lot of Viking ones had something else in them. Uh, 829Bs, which were available on the surplus market. Uh, I happen to have one with a beautifully built with a pair of 807s in the final. Uh, another very popular Johnson kit, even now, is the Viking Ranger. It's a single 6146 with a built-in VFO, band switch 160 through 10, uh, AM and CW 65-75 watts. Very nice, compact for its day, and uh, quite capable little rig. In the late 40s uh, through the mid 50s, uh, the number of hams increased uh, tremendously from about 90,000 in 1950 to 140,000 by 1956. As I mentioned earlier, television interference was a major problem. Uh, transmitters had to be shielded and filtered. Uh, television sets needed high pass filters, but we finally got around living together. <coughs> the novice license uh, brought a tremendous number of new hams in. Instead of uh, the 13 word a minute code speed exam, which was required for the uh, class B or class C license uh, prior to the novice, novices only had to pass a five word a minute sending and receiving exam. The uh, ticket was good for one year, you couldn't renew it, and we got 50 kilohertz on 80. We got all of 11 meters, which was 2696 to 2723, and we got the middle 2 megahertz of 2 meters, which we could use for phone or CW. Later on, the novices got uh, more CW room on 40 and 15. And novice transmitters had to be 75 watts or less and crystal controlled. The technician license was also introduced in 51, took a five word a minute code exam and the general class a theory exam, started off with privileges uh, everything above 220 megahertz and later uh, came down to six meters. Then in 1953, Heathkit entered the ham radio market and uh, undercut Johnson and uh, Collins and other competitors as far as prices went. I uh, took a look at 63 of my uh, 1952 novice QSL cards and uh, found out some interesting things about what novices generally spent on their stations in 1952. More than two-thirds of the novices had less than $150 uh, invested in their uh, stations and their transmitters or receivers. And interestingly, two-thirds of the novice transmitters were home-brewed. Uh, certainly, uh, that's different from the situation today with uh, folks starting out. Uh, of the rest of them, 12% uh, were more surplus command transmitters and 22% were commercial with 40% of those commercials being kits. The least expensive complete 80 meter novice station in 1952 could be put on the air for about $16, believe it or not. Uh, you could get used command sets, receiver and transmitter for about $9 together you could boost the power supply from an old radio or TV for free. Um, I could buy uh, surplus antenna wire and insulators from Steinberg's in Cincinnati for two bucks. Phones cost about three bucks. Uh, a crystal was one and a J38 key was one. And uh, that got you on the air with a pretty decent uh, station for not very much money. This is a distribution of uh, price on the left-hand side for 1952 novice receivers. You'll see that there were an awful lot of uh, receivers new and used that were in the uh, uh, 40 to 60 dollar price range. Those were the Hallicrafters S38s and things of that sort. And uh, 
the receivers in the zero to twenty dollar class were mainly command sets. Uh, as far as the receiver age in 1952, quite a few of them were new, uh, but there were others that were purchased, uh, used uh, under seven years of age. Those were the post World War II receivers. Then there's a big bump for World War II surplus receivers and uh, back beyond that into the, the pre-war category. Uh, the price distribution of the novice transmitters was uh, uh, likewise mostly on the inexpensive side. Uh, I had to uh, figure out what some of the home-built transmitters would cost and I uh, costed them on the basis of commercial trans transmitter kits of the uh, same number of tubes and same power output, but the vast majority of novice transmitters uh, went for under $50 in that time. Here's a typical 1953 novice station uh, with my, uh, my friend John McCauley, who was then KN4AWW. Uh, this is John with his original Heathkit AT1 which was uh, $29.50 in 1953, and with his Howard 435A receiver, which was a pre-World War II receiver, not too bad actually, he had a uh, tuned RF stage and one IF stage. Uh, John and I bought that uh, for him for 10 bucks. Uh, and the total investment that John had in his station, we figured out was uh, uh, under $45. And here's a not so typical uh, novice station in 1952. Me, I was WN4VIV and my receiver was an HRO50 which I still have and it's my favorite receiver even now. My transmitter was homebrew 6AG7 6146 75 watts. Uh, on the right hand side you'll see a rebuild of that particular transmitter with some of the original parts. I built it into a BC375 tuning unit then and that's what this one uh, is built into now. This is my ham shack uh, in 2020. This is my inside ham shack. I've got another one out in the garage that you saw at the beginning of the talk. And down here on the lower uh, right hand side is my HRO 50 and uh, two decks above it also on the right hand side is Bob Higgy's HRO. This is my original HRO 50. My father, God bless his soul, bought it for my brother and myself in August of 1950 and thanks to that I became an electrical engineer and had a very happy career and was able to raise my family and a lot of other things. Okay, and here are some of the Heathkit offerings from that era. The AT-1 hit the, uh, the market in 1953. It was the first piece of amateur gear, or amateur-oriented gear, that Heathkit came out with. Prior to that, they were selling things like oscilloscopes and uh, kits for test instruments. But it covered 80 through 10, including 15, crystal control, band switched, and uh, 35 watts input and it was an instant success. It was uh, uh, came in a shielded cabinet, was reasonably TVI proofed and you could add a VFO for another 1950 uh, which made it useful when you upgraded the general class as well. In 1955 Heath came out with a DX100 which was uh, sort of a reverse engineered Viking II with the VFO built in and it undersold the Viking II considerably at 190 bucks. Uh, it was quite a success in its era and it's a very good transmitter. Up till now we've been talking about AM CW transmitters. We have to step back a few years and pick up a very important development in amateur radio technology in the uh, late 40s, single sideband 
telephony. Single sideband actually started uh, much earlier than 1947. Uh, J.R. Carson, an AT&T engineer, invented a single sideband in 1915. And AT&T first deployed single sideband in their Type A telephone carrier system in 1918. The Type A carrier put four two-way channels of single sideband telephony on top of the, uh, the normal voice frequency band on a, uh, a twisted pair of uh, telephone wires. In 1927, AT&T had progressed to the point where they actually opened a two-way single sideband radio telephone service between the United States and England. It was a low frequency uh, system. Uh, the suppressed carrier frequency was, I believe, 58.5 kilohertz, and uh, it was a upper sideband signal. They had uh, a 750 watt linear amplifier on the system at that point in time and uh, up their power as they went along. In 1933, the hams actually uh, started to get involved with single sideband. Robert Moore, W60EI out in California, put a uh, single sideband signal, a lower sideband signal on 75 meters. He used the, uh, the AT&T uh, filter technology, starting off with a balanced modulator at 10 kilohertz and up converting in a couple of steps to, uh, to get to 39, well, to get to uh, 75 meters. And by 1934, there were a half a dozen California stations on single sideband. Unfortunately, it never did catch on. Uh, single sideband was a lot more complicated and a lot more expensive to uh, implement than uh, normal AM with uh, a carrier and two sidebands. And the receivers of 1934 also weren't particularly well suited to receiving single sideband. By 1947, however, things had changed considerably. Uh, Oswald Mike Villard put the uh, Stanford University club station, W6YX, on 3970 on single sideband. Mike was the trustee of W6YX and also uh, an electrical engineering assistant professor. And he put together a 20 watt uh, phasing transmitter with four 6L6s and a uh, balanced modulator and he used the new dome audio phase shift network that had been published uh, the previous December <coughs> uh, in electronics magazine and which gave a 90 degree phase shift uh, from 60 to uh, 7000 uh, Hertz uh, and allowed him to uh, uh, put together a phasing generator and transmitter on his transmitting frequency rather than uh, starting off at a low frequency and using multiple conversions. Um, a couple of weeks after that, uh, W0NWF had rapidly thrown together an 11 tube uh, filter transmitter based on the uh, nine kilo based on the nine kilohertz uh, initial filter and a couple of conversions to get up to 20 meters. Uh, he used an 807 in his output with 10 watts PEP. Villard had upped his uh, game to uh, four 813s in a balanced modulator, generating his signal directly on 20 meters. And he ran 400 watts PEP. And because of this QSO and subsequent QSOs between the two of them, uh, the entire country of amateurs was able to listen to single sideband on 75 meters. In uh, July of 1948, there were a total of seven single sideband transmitters on the air in the United States on 75, uh, 20, and 10 meters. Here's a significant single sideband transmitter from uh, 1950. Don Norgard, W2KUJ, was working for General Electric at that time. And Don 
developed and then published in the GE Ham News for November, December 1950, his single sideband junior. It was a uh, 75 meter transmitter using the phasing technology, so it generated its single sideband signal directly on the 75 uh, meter frequency involved. Uh, ran all of 5 watts PEP out of a 6AG7, as you can see down there in the schematic diagram. And it used all of three tubes and four crystal diodes. Uh, the interesting thing to me about this transmitter is that it turned up to be at the heart of a good many uh, single sideband transmitters that were using this phasing technology throughout the 50s including transmitters uh, built by Eldico and uh, Central Electronics. Eldico actually brought out a version of this single sideband junior commercially in 1951 and they uh, sold it for $70 as a kit and for $100 uh, wired and tested. One of the very earliest uh, successful commercial manufacturers of uh, single sideband exciters and transmitters was Central Electronics, uh, headed by Wes Shum uh, out of Chicago. Uh, the Model 10A multiphase exciter uh, came out in 1953 and it was at the right price at $100 for a kit or $130 wired and tested and uh, it had the right performance. It covered all the way from 160 to 10, not only with sideband, but also with uh, AM phase modulation and CW. And uh, it had 10 watts of PEP output. And uh, believe it or not, there was a single sideband junior inside running at nine megahertz. Uh, that's how it started its, uh, its phasing signal. By 1958, uh, the Central Electronics Company had uh, progressed considerably. They brought out their multi-phase 100V, which is a, uh, an 80 to 10 meter uh, transmitter with a VFO inside. Uh, uh, and everything except the VFO is broadband tuning. So all you have to do with a 100V is uh, set the VFO and the frequency you want and uh, you're ready to go. Uh, it uh, features uh, frequency shift keying, CW, upper and lower sideband and double sideband with or without carrier and phase modulation, 100 watts PEP and there is another single sideband junior inside this rig at 8 megahertz. By the way, the, uh, the 10A uh, had to be supplied with its own external uh, frequency control unit uh, if it wasn't crystal and the BC458 uh, command set was a very popular VFO to use with it because with a little bit of jiggling it could provide a VFO in all the bands that the 10A covered. Collins finally hit the uh, single sideband market in 1955 <coughs> which is with uh, what we referred to in those days as the gold dust twins. The 75A4 receiver was the uh, uh, descendant of the 75A1. It has all of the passband, or rather all of the uh, crystal controlled converter features of the A1 plus Collins mechanical filters which were new and uh, uh, offered great selectivity uh, at both 6 kilohertz wide for AM 2.8 for sideband and uh, uh, 500 hertz wide for CW offered passband tuning and a product detector and AGC for single sideband. Uh, the KWS-1 was the uh, transmitter that went along with the A4 uh, covers 80 through 10 sideband SSB and AM and a kilowatt PEP uh, level and uh, was a mere two thousand dollars. The A4 itself is uh, 645 so you can see why we call them the gold dust twins. Other uh, old line companies uh, got on board pretty quickly at that point 
and introduced uh, separate sideband transmitters and receivers, Halicrafters came out with the SX101 and HT32 family and uh, broadened them to some other transmitters and receivers, as you'll see. Hammerlin came out with the HQ170, which was a handband only receiver, and the HQ180, which was a descendant of the HQ120 that we talked about earlier. They also brought out uh, uh, the HX50 and the HX500 in uh, uh, 61 and uh, 60. Heathkit, not to be uh, undone, brought out the RX1 receiver and TX10 uh, transmitter. Uh, Johnson brought out a pacemaker, a single sideband exciter and a uh, 2 kilowatt invader and National brought out the NC300 and 303 handband only receivers and a somewhat uh, smaller NC270. This was a real game changer. In 1957, Collins revolutionized uh, HF ham radio really by bringing out the KWM1 transceiver a uh, receiver and transmitter built into the same box. Uh, the KWM-1 covered 20 through 10 meters. Uh, you could crystal it up to cover any frequency within that range. Most hams covered 20, 15, and 10. And in 1960, they brought out the KWM-1-2, or KWM-2, uh, which covered 80 through 10. And uh, they really uh, took the market away from the uh, the separates for a uh, to a large extent. So that's the fifties, nineteen sixty through nineteen ninety, uh, went through steady progression in the uh, uh, development of ham equipment. Uh, we transitioned from kit to commercial built transceivers. Uh, and from United States to Japanese manufacturers largely there. We went from tubes to solid state rigs and from uh, analog circuitry to digital circuitry in that period of time. You can see the transceivers went first of all from the KWM1, KWM2 by Collins through uh, solid state gear such as the Sideband Engineers 33, the uh, Tentec Argonaut in 1970, which was fully solid state, and uh, we went from uh, in the 80s from analog solid state to uh, digital frequency counters and finally microprocessor uh, controlled rigs and synthesized VFOs. I won't speak too much about VHF gear, there just isn't enough time, but 2 meter FM certainly came in around 1968 and uh, slow scan TV came in, uh, various digital modes, packet mTOR PRB1 in the 80s. Uh, a lot of companies came into and went out of business. Central Electronics, the early single sideband uh, manufacturer, left in 1962. Uh, Tentec came in in 68 and uh, stayed through 1990 and beyond. Uh, Yesu, Kenwood, and ICOM entered in the early 70s or late 60s. Uh, Johnson, Hamerlin, and SBE dropped out. Halicrafters, National, and Collins dropped out. And finally, Heathkit and Drake dropped out in the early 70s. Uh, Frequency-wise, we got 160 restored in 68 and beginning in 1980 we began to get newer bands in the uh, range between uh, 20 and 10. Uh, as you know they were called the warp bands 30 meters and 82, 12 meters and 85 and 17 meters and 89. This is the uh, change in number of amateur radio licenses from 1970 through 2009, as you can see, the totals went up from uh, just a little under 
300,000 in 1970 to almost 700,000 in uh, 2009. This is what Bob Higgy was using in uh, 1966 when I helped him move from his home to his new apartment and when he gave me his HRO. He had a Halicrafters SX-101, which was a good sideband AMCW uh, receiver. Uh, it cost $395 new. And a Johnson Viking 500 transmitter. Uh, 500 watt level and 800 bucks as a kit. I think Bob probably wired his own transmitter. Uh, there were other companies that came out with uh, transceivers after Collins did and also uh, receiver and transmitter pairs which uh, could be tied together so that they would transceive. Collins came out with the S-Line uh, Drake came out with their TR4 and TR3 transceivers and also with their four line receivers and transmitters in the, uh, in the 60s. These were all uh, tube based rigs for the most part. Uh, my uh, T4X and R4B have solid state VFOs but the, uh, uh, the rest of the electronics are still tubes. Heathkit stayed in the business with uh, a vengeance. They offered uh, lower price alternatives to the, uh, the Collins gear. Uh, the SB100 line of transceivers, uh, a lower priced uh, version of those, the HW, the Hot Water 100 transceiver line, and also uh, separate pairs, the SB300 line of receivers and the SB400 line of transmitters. Uh, in the early 70s, uh, transceivers went solid state. One of the first all solid state transceivers was the Tentec Argonaut that came out in 71. Uh, 5 watts PEP sideband and CW and could be run from a 12 volt battery. Uh, nice little portable rig and uh, I have one that uh, still does a good job on the classic exchange. Uh, Tentec in 73 came out with a 100 or 200 watt level uh, solid state transceiver, the uh, Triton 1 and Triton 2. So the solid state uh, transceivers uh, started off uh, just being analog in terms of the, uh, the circuitry where uh, solid state analog stages replaced the uh, tube stages and earlier transceiver designs. But gradually, digital circuits were incorporated. First off, frequency counters replaced the uh, dial readouts, and eventually uh, the oscillators were synthesized rather than free running. Uh, microprocessors and other specialized digital ICs became available, and uh, more functions were transferred to uh, software controlled digital circuits, uh, starting off with the IF and audio stages uh, where they could create uh, great filters and notches. And uh, by 2018, digital signal processing had gone to direct sampling of signal inputs as high as two meters. So let's have a look at uh, Tentec and some of the other American manufacturers to see how some of that progression. Here's Bob Higgy's last radio. Uh, Bob at this point was uh, uh, 75 years old in 1977. He had Parkinson's and uh, was having difficulty uh, speaking, but he could still operate CW, believe it or not. So he bought a Tentec Century 21, which was a, uh, a CW uh, uh, only transmitter and could receive sideband as well. Um, it was all solid state and analog. You just turned it on, selected the band and, uh, uh, and operated. 
this shows you how the uh, uh, total number of ham radio licenses went from uh, uh, 1997 uh, through 2018 and you'll notice that uh, there was a bit of a dip uh, until 2007 when the no code licenses came in on February 23rd and then things took off again and went to uh, over 740,000 licenses as of 2018. This shows you uh, how the number of each class of radio license went in that same period. And you'll notice that the uh, technician class is definitely the most popular class of licenses uh, over that time period. Okay, here's what Tentec did in the 80s. <coughs> Uh, by 1985, their Corsair II uh, had a uh, permeability tuned oscillator, uh, an analog oscillator, but a digital frequency counter and no microprocessor. In 1987, they progressed to a microprocessor controlled synthesized VFO uh, because they had uh, a microprocessor, they could offer features like scanning, keypad entry, uh, and other features, but uh, unfortunately the phase noise in the, uh, the oscillator limited weak signal receive capability, and there was a fairly high uh, off frequency noise on transmit as well, uh, minus 90 d uh, dB uh, below the carrier. Per hertz. By 1993, Tentec had made a considerable improvement in their Omni 6 line. It had a, a very clean synthesized VFO. The uh, <coughs> off frequency transmit noise you'll notice is uh, 18 dB lower than it was on the, uh, the earlier Paragon and uh, had uh, two tunable memories, uh, digital signal processing, uh, giving it uh, better filtering capability, including a notch filter that was automatic that could uh, hit a frequency of your interfering signal. It could be externally computer controlled and uh, voice synthesized. Here's the Orion. And, uh, as I mentioned, it has uh, a lot of digital uh, signal processing features, although the receiver still does have some analog roofing filters. Jumping ahead to 2008, Tentec brought out the Orion 2, the second uh, rig in the Orion line. It was a, or is, a completely software-defined radio. Um, its character is defined in its internal read-only memory and it can be upgraded via the internet to the latest model. Uh, all the receiver processing functions uh, from filtering to detection and everything else uh, are 100% are defined in the receiver firmware. Uh, digital signal processing starts at the receiver IF but the receiver does have several analog roofing filters at the uh, uh, bandwidths that are mentioned down on the bottom. And the uh, off-frequency transmit noise on this rig is uh, uh, much better even than the, uh, the Omni 6 being at uh, minus 136 uh, dB below the carrier. Here's another uh, 2012 American radio, the Electcraft KX3, uh, which uh, has a lot of DSP features, uh, 10 watts on the HF and 6 meter bands, uh, transmitter noise is uh, again very low, and um, for current prices uh, at $900 or $1,000, uh, you get a lot of radio, a lot of bang for the buck. Flex Radio has a uh, 
System 6000 Signature Series, uh, 100 watts, 160 through 6, all modes, uh, SDR, uh, came out with the uh, 7300, which was described in the review as an entry-level HF radio, which I kind of chuckle at when I see uh, what entry-level HF radios were like when I was a novice in, uh, in 1953, 52. Uh, software defined 160 through 6, uh, spectrum scope, and a lot of other features. And when you consider that uh, the price difference between 1952-53 and uh, now is approximately a 10x feature, uh, that would have been a $135 radio in the early 50s. So it compares quite well with what you could buy for $135 in uh, the time when I was in office. If $1,350 is too much for your pocketbook right now, here's an example of uh, what you can find in the, uh, the lower priced range in fantastically uh, good looking little rigs uh, these days. The uh, Micro Bit X uh, is a 10 watt easy to build transceiver kit that covers uh, from 3 to 30 megahertz they say, um, with 10 watts BEP on the lower HF bands going down to 2 watts on, uh, on 10 meters, single sideband and CW, all sorts of features based on an Arduino uh, microcontroller, and uh, you can buy assembled boards for the basic uh, kit for all of $129 or the, uh, the full kit for $209. When you compare that to uh, uh, $16 times 10 for a couple of command sets uh, in 1952, you are getting an awful lot of bang for the buck. There's an even less expensive current option, the QRP Labs QCX Plus uh, single band line of uh, transceivers. For only $49, uh, you get a 5 watt single band CW transceiver kit with a uh, high performance receiver that has 200 hertz of CW selectivity. It has all sorts of features, including, for example, a whisper or built in uh, CW uh, beacon, uh, built in alignment and test equipment. Uh, these little guys are available for the uh, bands 80, 60, 40, 30, 20, and 17 meters. And uh, they're just an amazing buy, especially when you consider uh, that in 1951, 52 money, they would have sold for $5. How about that? Okay. If you want to listen to vintage radio on the air, or if you want to work vintage radio on the air, you've got a number of good opportunities. The AWA uh, sponsors the Bruce Kelly 1929 QSO party. The next one will be coming up in November, and it's for those 1929 Hartleys and MOPAs. It'll be running on 160 and 80 and 40, and it'll also include 20 meters uh, this coming November. The Link Condal Memorial CW Contest is for pre-1950 transmitters and receivers. It'll run in January coming up. The Amplitude Modulation QSO Party will be running in February. Uh, the John Rollins Memorial DX Contest for pre-1960 gear will be coming up in March and is for both CW and AM. And you'll have to uh, take a look at the AWA webpage to get the exact date for the Condal, the AM, and the John Rollins contests. There's also the Classic Exchange, which is uh, <clears throat> not an AWA, but a, a separate contest. 
that is for any vintage equipment, the older the better the score you have, for all modes basically on all bands 160 through 2 and the, uh, the next CX will be coming up in September and uh, 2020 and uh, uh, January and February 2021. A final word from uh, David Sumner, the retiring or retired AWRL CEO in QST uh, May 2016, that I think is very appropriate. Dave said, prior generations of radio amateurs would be astounded to see what we can accomplish with the technology tools that are available to us and the frequency allocations we now enjoy. If we could gaze into the future, I believe we would be equally astounded. And at long last, a couple of words of thanks. First of all, to my dad for buying me that HRO 50. He uh, really made a good investment in my future, and I've been very thankful to him for that ever since. Also to my older brother, Bob, W4RXK, uh, for his guidance and encouragement as an older sibling uh, uh, to me as a young ham. To Neil Wagon, W0VLZ, for his Bruce Kelly video, which we all enjoyed. To my friend and fellow New Mexico Radio Collector Club member, John Anthes, for his big help and support with this PowerPoint presentation. And of course to you for putting up with me and, uh, and listening to all of this. Thanks a lot.